Hello everyone and welcome back to video number one where we're going to be looking at the extinction of species. So this is kind of like the um, the background of extinction um, within individual species as well as a little bit of the history of thought regarding extinctions. Um, and as you can tell from my cover slide, I'm a big fan of Gustav Dory. So, you know, if you ever want some nice woodcuts of biblical scenes, Gustav Dory, good place to look. So without further ado, let's move onwards and let's go first look at who first identified extinction. So I wanted to put this slide in. This is my bit on the history of evolutionary thought, essentially, because extinction was not thought to exist throughout many of our early scientific, scientific endeavours. So um, if you know about the Enlightenment, this is the period of time when people started turning to evidence and reason as a basis for kind of na naturalistic explanations of the world. Um, geology as a topic was being born hand in hand with paleontology. Uh, and at this point, most scientists in Europe and America still believed that the natural world was complete, full and perfect as created by God. So even though we had this kind of um, rationalistic movement towards um, towards trying to understand the world, I have a feeling based on my reading that there wasn't this widespread um, feeling uh, that that applied to um, uh, to extinction essentially to the to the fossil record, and so within that worldview, no species ever became extinct because such an event event would destroy the perfection of nature, right? And so um, it took the world a while, really, to um, cotton on to the existence of extinction. And this happened through the work of uh, a number of people, but the person that I'm going to be introducing to you today is Georges Cuvier, this handsome chap on the left here, who lived from 1769 to 1832. So this was during that Enlightenment period, um, and he was a voice of... Um, of essentially um, of logic and reason, I suppose, during this time period, who established extinction through study of the natural world. He was a French naturalist and zoologist. He was based in Paris. And during his life, as I've mentioned, the existence of extinct species was frequently questioned by many scientists. He, however, showed that this must have occurred. And he demonstrated this by using a thing called comparative anatomy. In particular, um, he did this uh, looking at vertebrates. The example that's shown on the right here is um, his study of elephant anatomy that showed that not only um, do African and Indian elephants, the bottom image here is an example of a jaw of a living Indian elephant differ from each other, so they should be considered different species. He identified that these were different species of elephants. But he also recognised, as part of this work, that the uh, fossil uh, mammoths, a jawbone of one of these, as shown on the top here, of Europe and Siberia, were different from either living elephant species. The implication of that discovery, given that mammoths are no longer around, must therefore be that the, um, uh, the mammoth species have gone extinct. And Georges Cuvier published study after study documenting the past existence of large mammals that resemble no living species. And by doing so, he helped embed the idea that extinction exists. I think it's of note that he suggested that extinctions could be due to periodic catastrophic floods. This placed him as a key proponent of an idea called catastrophism. Um, this is kind of often contrasted to the idea of uniformitarianism. So uniformitarianism is the idea that things uh, that happen today happened in the same way in the past, whereas cat uh, catastrophism is the idea that there were the, um, these are kind of um, punctuated by um, sudden changes in, environment, in environments. And these were, were two, um, at the time, seen as fairly uh, mutually exclusive ideas that kind of battled it out over many years over the development of geology. Um, and indeed, uh, we have a far more nuanced view of, of that today, as we'll be getting onto in the later um, videos in this series. But just bear in mind that that was uh, one area that he had quite a lot of say. So along with his idea of extinctions, he had this idea of large catastrophes. And certainly, the idea that single species went extinct 
was accepted by most people following his work and his publications relatively quickly. So we now know that extinction happens all the time. Okay, species have a natural duration of anything from a few thousand years to a few million. And so they live for a time and they disappear. This could be due to um, a, a wide range of different causes that we're going to be looking at um, later in this particular video. Um, but the examples I've chosen uh, to put on this slide are examples where organisms, species have gone extinct due to the activities of man. So my example on the left here is the famous dodo, a ground dwelling relative of the pigeons, whose extinction resulted from the impact of man through both hunting, although I, I believe that contemporary accounts of the dodo uh, suggested that they didn't taste particularly good. So that's a, a bit of a kick in the teeth in terms of the hunting, but also through invasive species on the island of Mauritius. So man's activities um, made this particular species of bird go extinct. So we recognize now, as I mentioned, that there is a pattern of normal background extinction. And this will often happen without any broad scale cause. Um, one could argue that man is a broad scale cause, but in many cases, looking back into the fossil record, species will just go extinct. Um, and there could be many reasons for that, but they won't necessarily be uh, ones that we can identify looking at the fossil record. This doesn't happen, I wanted to highlight uh, as my other example on this slide, um, in uh, you know, globally at once, um, what we tend to see is a thing called extirpation. This is localized extinctions in a particular area. And this occurs before the complete extinction of the species. So this could be viewed as the species may have a fairly big range and then that contracts prior to their extinction. And in any of these areas, um, which aren't um, where they're contracting towards, that will appear like a localized extinction. In the fossil record, that will appear as the extinction of that species if we don't have rocks from where they're still living. Um, but that's actually a thing called extirpation. So extinction rarely happens globally in one place. My example of this is shown on the right, and I think this is a really good example. So this is a um, Rocky Mountain locust, this little guy here, really handsome chap, an orthopteran insect. Um, and this is a really good example of how ranges can reduce before a species eventually dies out. So this locust is particularly interesting because it coalesced into swarms, um, which were really, really large. Swarms of this Rocky Mountain locust consumed 50 tons of vegetation a day. In 1875, this species formed the largest locust swarm in recorded history. It was an aggregation of around 3.5 trillion insects. It formed a 110 mile wide, 1800 mile long aerial river of insects that eclipsed the sun's for sun for five days as it passed overhead, according to um, accounts at the time. So this is a really, really um, impressive um, pattern uh, that we see within this particular insect. However, between uh, these uh, swarms, these drought driven upsurges, the locusts actually retreated into the Mount Rocky Mountains shown here in the middle. These are the extent of the swarms, but their home is, is around here in the Rocky Mountains. Um, where they generally lived most of their life in fertile montane, so mountain based river valleys. This was what we would call a tight ecological bottleneck. And it also happens to be um, areas of land that pioneers were converting to agricultural production um, by the early late 1800s and early 1900s that decimated the breeding ground of this insect and they were extinct by 1902. So between 1875 and 1902, um, the uh, behavior and the, the habitat changes driven by humans has led from this being a insect that could swarm over many parts, a significant proportion of the US to one that was going extinct. So that's an example of species extinction. So let's give it a definition. And you can see I've put a definition on the slide here. Extinction is the irreversible condition of a species or other group of organisms of having no living representatives in the wild. 
which follows the death of the last surviving individual of that species or group. Extinction may occur on a local or a global level. More broadly, we can say that a species is functionally extinct when all interbreeding populations have been eliminated, or a population is small enough that it is no longer viable. So while our definition that I've just given you says extinction occurs when the last thing dies, um, before that point, we may be able to identify that a species is essentially functionally extinct. It's not going to survive. The example that I've put on this slide, which is a very sad one, is Sudan. This is the last male northern white rhino dying, being comforted by a guy called Joseph Okira, one of the people that was looking after him. And Sudan died in March 20, 2018. He was the last representative of this particular subspecies of rhino. And it was an extinction that has been caused by poaching uh, since the 1970s. So this is our example. This picture, um, I guess, is uh, records the point at which this particular group of rhinos goes extinct. So if we're thinking about this in terms of kind of the broad sweep of life and its history on Earth, we can say that between 5 and 50 billion species have lived on Earth. Big error bars on that. It's an estimate, so take it for what it's worth. There are 5 to 15 million species uh, alive today, most estimates would suggest. This means that, if you think about it, 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever lived are now extinct. Okay, Species have been lost either through perturbations imposed on them from the outside. These are things that we would call extrinsic causes for, um, for of extinction. So these could be biotic or abiotic. Or um, extinction could result from evolutionary changes within the members of a species. These are what we would call, call intrinsic causes. So extrinsic from outside, intrinsic from inside. Obviously, these two different types of causes of extinction can and do interact. We should also note that extinction isn't really thought to be random much of the time. For example, it appears to be um, phylogenetically nested. So um, things that are more closely related to each other, um, if one of those goes extinct, other um, closely related organisms are more likely to go extinct than in other areas of the tree of life. A useful way to, to kind of think about this and to identify why this may be the case is that there are factors um, which dictate extinction risk within any, and within any area of the tree of life. So for example, we know that body size um, may well have an impact on extinction risk. There is some evidence that larger body sizes in mammals, for example, um, increase extinction risk. And there's also evidence in other groups that extremes of body size, either if you're really small or really large, make you far more likely to go extinct. It's uh, fairly well uh, documented that specialization um, makes you more likely to go extinct. So for example, if you specialize towards a narrow temperature range, or a specific prey item, um, that increases your risk of extinction. Um, so that kind of makes sense, right? If you are specialized for one particular um, temperature and there is a global climatic shift, it may be that your species range um, no longer exists or it moves to a, a different area where you're in co competition with different organisms and therefore you're more likely to go extinct. You can compare specialism to generalism. There are some organisms that are just fairly good at living wherever you put them. Uh, a typical example people tend to think of is the cockroach, and certainly pest cockroach species, species that we have in, in, say, towns and cities, can survive by eating virtually anything. Unlike the panda on the left here, my example of a specialist, which is specialised towards eating bamboo, um, so that has quite a, a limited um, diet. Unlike that, modern cockroaches can survive by eating electrical insulation. So that gives them a far wider range of things they can eat to survive if they need to. Them, they're generalists. Another thing, another kind of intrinsic um, uh, kind of uh, 
part of the uh, of a, a particular area of the tree of life could be reproductive rate. So low rates of reproduction increase the risk of um, of something going extinct. Bear in mind, of course, that reproductive rate is linked to both body size, which is another risk factor, and to population density. And the panda is another good example of this. Furthermore, um, the uh, range size is a uh, good uh, is um, linked to the risk of extinction within groups. So, um, species with small geographic ranges are more likely to go extinct. Uh, the top of this image on the right here, you can see the concentration of mammal species with limited geographic ranges. And on the uh, bottom here, you can see the concentration of threatened mammal species. And you can see that those two do, to a degree, coincide, because the smaller your range is, the, the more likely you are to go extinct. And we should bear in mind that when we're thinking about the extinction of species, as we have been talking about, that the extinction of one species is likely to have knock-on effects within the ecosystem in which it lives. And that includes further extinctions. There's an ecological concept, the idea of a keystone species. This is a species which has a disproportionately large effect on an ecosystem relative to its abundance. And the knock-on um, effect of those going extinct, those keystone species, is likely to be particularly large. An extreme form of um, of this kind of uh, this impact, this knock-on effect, is when co-extinction co occurs. So, for example, if you are a um, predator specialising on a particular prey item, and that prey item goes extinct, or, for example, you are a plant relying on a particular pollinator, and that goes extinct, or you're a parasite and you're parasitizing a large organism, if that goes extinct, this is likely to be a bad time for your species. So the extinction of that related species, um, or sorry, I shouldn't say related, not um, that ecologically rather than phylogenetically related species, is likely to spell the end of the existence of your species. You can't survive as a parasite without a host, as a plant without your pollinator, or as a predator without your particular prey item, in many cases. I think the avocados are a particularly neat example of this, which I wanted to put into this lecture because I learned it this while writing the lecture and it's really cool. It's been suggested that avocados, um, you can see an example of one of these here. Have you ever thought about why they have this massive stone, this seed in the middle? What is the point of having a seed that is so large um, that the majority of um, creatures can't eat it? Right? Doesn't make sense. Generally, seeds are there to be eaten by mammals um, or birds or other organisms that can um, uh, can then distribute it. And um, while they're digesting the fruit, um, they will es eventually um, uh, kind of uh, evacuate the seed, leave it in a nice pile of fertilizing manure for you, and that's providing a, a useful function. But that makes no sense if your seed is so big that things can't eat it, which seems to be the case in avocados. Well, it's actually been suggested that this is a specialization towards um, ground sloths, which used to be um, around in the Americas um, and were there along with a number of other members of the Pleistocene megafauna were eating avocados and spreading these massive seeds. Obviously, a lot of these extinct organisms that were very, very large were capable of eating these very large seeds. These are now extinct. And indeed, if it weren't for the fact that we farm avocados, they would probably be at risk of extinction because seed dispersal by living species is not really possible anymore. So we're looking at this situation where the a seed spreader has gone extinct, but the specializations towards that seed spreader are surviving within this particular um, crop, which is really interesting. So I wanted to finish by looking at the extrinsic, the um, kind of factors that can cause extinction. And I wanted to start with extrinsic factors. Um, and indeed, I, I think I'll probably, for this, um, for the purposes of this lecture, only focus on these. So extrinsic factors, that, factors that cause extinctions include habitat habitat degradation or destruction. This is when a habitat becomes incapable of supporting its native species. 
So think about that um, today, that's largely driven by human activities. We're changing a uh, lot of environments and driving the organisms that are in those to extinction. Predation and disease can cause extinctions. Um, so pre predators and pathogens evolve, and if a species does not keep up, does not manage to evolve to, um, to meet that threat, um, those, those threats can threaten the survival of that species. Right? So there's this constant arm race, this idea of the Red Queen that we met in the first video set of videos that I did for you uh, of co-evolution of these things. Climate change can cause extinction. This happens throughout Earth history. Um, it changes the range of organisms and can then drive those um, organisms and those species into extinction as their ranges become um, either increasingly small or um, it brings them into contact with other species which, with which they have to compete. Invasive species um, are a significant driver of mass extinctions, especially today. This occurs if a species that is not native to a specific location is introduced. So this can either be through natural causes, such as plate tectonics, that's happened multiple times over the, the history of animal life, certainly on the continents of the Earth, but also through anthropogenic activities. Two examples of the latter are shown uh, on this slide here. Um, so on the left here, you can see the Asian hornet, which was identified for the first time in the UK in 2016. This creature, while it looks beautiful on this slide, is a voracious predator of honeybees and other insects. And so its introduction here is a significant worry for our native insects. Um, the other example here is the Eastern Grey Squirrel. This was deliberately released into the wild in Great Britain in 1876. The species carries a pox virus to which the native red squirrel is particularly susceptible. As such, as a result of this introduction, red squirrels have now been essentially wiped out across Britain, with few remaining in England or Wales. There are some strongholds uh, in further, the further north, but the impact of the, the introduction of this species over the course of 100 years has been quite significant. Well, I suppose 125, 145 years. Either way, that's relatively quick on geological timescales. Ironically now, in parts of the UK, a, a melanistic, so black form of the Eastern Grey Squirrel is now driving the grey form out. So that's particularly true in, for example, Cambridgeshire, um, where black squirrels are now becoming more common than grey squirrels. Today, many of these extrinsic factors are driven by human activity, and we'll be learning a lot more about that in the final video um, of today's series. So that is the extinction of species. I hope it was interesting. I accept it was a bit depressing, especially that thing about Sudan, poor Sudan. Um, and we'll get on to mass extinctions in our next video. I'll see you in a minute.